lecture where we will unravel the mysteries of our cell membrane, the guardians of our cells. So all right, so imagine a cell is like a tiny house and the cell membrane is like the walls and the doors of that house. It's just like the walls and doors that keeps things inside your house safe and let some things in and go out. Our cell membrane does the same for the cell. It is a protective layer that surrounds the cell, keeping all the important stuff inside and letting only what the cell needs, like food, oxygen. And um, it's the gatekeeper of the cell at the same time, so it's uh, deciding what could come in and go out to keep the cell healthy and happy. Let's talk about the nerve gas. Sarin is a type of nerve gas, a chemical weapon that interferes with the nervous system. In this particular pr chapter, we will demonstrate how proteins in the cell, uh, cell membrane convert chemical signals to electrical signals that are required for many physiological activities. And an introduction to your cell membrane, you will see in the photo on, on, on your right, a trilaminar appearance of the membranes. This is com uh, coming from an electron micrograph showing you the three-layered trilaminar structure of the plasma membrane of an erythrocyte, the red blood cell, after staining the tissue with the heavy metal osmium. Osmium binds preferentially to the polar and head groups of the lipid bilayer, which we'll talk about later, producing the trilaminar pattern. The arrows uh, will denote the inner and outer edges of the membrane. The plasma membrane or the outer boundary of the cell separates it from the world and it's a thin fragile structure about 5 to 10 nanometer thick and we need electron microscopes to examine the cell membranes. And um, closely plants and animals and microorganisms, micro microbes, have the same ultrastructure. So let's try to give you an overview or study the overview of the membrane functions. Transporting solutes, you'll see here um, responding to external signals. So the photo on your right is the summary of membrane functions in a plant cell. So this is compartmentalized in number one. You will see number one, it's compartmentalized in which the hydrolytic enzymes such as acid hydrolases are sequestered within the membrane bounded vacuole. Number two, an example of the role of the cytoplasmic membranes as the site for enzyme localization. So we fixate the plant cell with carbon dioxide, which is catalyzed by the enzyme, and the, the enzyme is associated with the outer surface of the thylakoid membranes of your chloroplasts. In number three, you will see an example of the role of membranes as a selectively permeable barrier. Water molecules, um, are able to penetrate rapidly through the plasma membrane and causing the plant cell to fill out the available space and exert pressure against its cell wall, making it rigid and um, facilitating the trigger pressure. An example of number four is the solute transport. Hydrogen ions, which are produced by uh, um, different various uh, metabolic processes in cytoplasm, are being pumped out of plant cells into the extracellular space by the transport proteins that are located, embedded in your plasma membrane. Number five is an example of the involvement of your membrane uh, in the transfer of information from one site to another. We call it signal transduction. In this case, hormones such as abscisic acid binds to the outer surface of the plasma membrane and triggers the release of these chemicals such as the IP3 into the cytoplasm. In this case, the IP3 um, releases calcium ions from a cytoplasmic warehouse. In number six, we have the, the roles of the cell membranes in cell-to-cell -cell communication. So cells communicate to each other. Um, this is opening. Uh, th there are openings between adjoining plant cells. We call them the plasmodesmata allowing the materials to move directly to the cytoplasm of one cell and its neighbors. And lastly, on the seventh item, which is the, uh, the role of membranes in energy transduction, because um, we need 
to convert the adenosine diphosphate to adenosine triphosphate in those associated with the inner membrane of your mitochondria. So it's not solely um, particular with the cell membrane of the cell, but there are some organelles inside your cells that has membranes, and that, that is the membrane function that we're talking about. Okay, so we have transporting solutes, responding to external signals, intracellular interaction, a selectively permeable barrier, and energy transduction. We take a look at the history of um, the plasma membrane structure. Membranes were found to be mostly composed of oil. And you will see in this image, the lipid bilayer accounted for the 2 is to 1 ratio of the lipid cell to uh, lipid to cell surface area so we calculate the surface area for um, of a lipid preparation so the plasma membrane remember that it's composed of a lipid bilayer and um, you will see in this photo we have the stationary barrier and the movable barrier so we calculate the surface area of the lipid when a sample of phospholipids is dissolved in organic solvent such as hexane, the phospholipid molecules form a layer over the water that is a single molecule thick, and we call it monomolecular layer. The, mon the molecules in this layer are oriented with their hydrophilic groups bonded to the surface of the water and their hydrophobic chains directed to the air. So to estimate the surface area um, of your lipids, if they were a part of the membrane, the lipid molecules can be compressed so you will see here the movable barrier compressing all the lipids okay and the lipid molecules in the uh, will again will be compressed to the mole or to the smallest possible area by means of your movable patterns using this type of apparatus we call it the Lamois tro after its in inventor Gorter and Grendel and um, they concluded that the red blood cells contain enough lipid to form a layer over their surface that was two molecule, two molecules thick. So we call it the bilayer. This is an electron micrograph of your nerve cell action. We uh, refer the um, this one as the myelin sheath as the outer surface or outer covering of these axons. Um, the nerve cell axon is surrounded by a myelin sheath. And this is consisting of concentric layers of plasma membranes that have extremely low protein to lipid ratio. The, again, the, the purpose of your myelin sheets is to insulate the nerves um, from the surrounding environment, and which increases the velocity at which your impulses can travel along the axon. These are electrical impulses, okay? And there's a perfect spacing between the layers which is maintained by interlocking these protein molecules we call it P is to zero that project in each of the membrane. Now we have membrane lipids. Membrane lipids are amphipathic. They contain both hydrophilic and hydrophobic regions. We have phosphoglycerides, sphingolipids, and cholesterol that are types of this. Let's talk about the first. This is a, the chemical structure of the membrane lipids. We have here um, the structures of the phosphoglycerides, the structure of the phospho, the, the sphingolipids. Sphingomyelin is one a good example okay, of a phospholipid. Cerebrocytes and gangliosides are glycolipids. And the third membrane lipid is what they call as your cholesterol, which are containing the R fatty acid ACL chain. So lipids with the phosphate groups are called phospholipids. Once again, with the visceral back backbone, we call them phosphoglycerides. Fatty acyl acids are hydrophobic, of course, and a fatty acid may be saturated, monounsaturated, or polyunsaturated. Cholesterol is smaller and less amphipathic. The sterol that makes up the 50% of animal membrane lipids and carbon rings are flat and rigid. You will see here the cholesterol molecules that are shown in green of your lipid bilayer. And they are oriented uh, with their small hydrophilic end facing the outer part of the bilayer and the bulk of their structure which are packaged in among the fatty acids of the phospholipids. 
the placement of your cholesterol molecules you'll see here are interfering with the flexibility of the lipid hydrocarbon chains and they tend to stiffen the bilayer while retaining its overall structure unlike other uh, lipids of the membrane the cholesterol is often rather even and distributed between the two layers and we call them the leaflets what is the nature and importance of the lipid bilayer um, first will be the leading the edge of the moving cell containing the sites where the plasma membrane displays undulating ruffles so you'll see movement here ruffling of the plasma membrane of a migrating cell next is cell division division of your cell is accompanied by the deformation of the plasma membrane as it is being pulled out toward the center of the cell so the forming a cleavage poro or a, a cell plate okay and um Unlike most of your dividing cells, the cleavage poro of these dividing cells you'll see in the photo, uh, tenophore egg begins at one pole and moves unidirectionally through the egg. And lastly, membranes are capable of fusing with other membranes. Uh, sperm and the egg are in the stage, you'll see it in this photo, to their fusion of their plasma membrane because they are flexible. Lipid bilayers can self-assemble. It has proven invaluable in membrane research, and they can be, we can insert proteins into the liposomes, membrane proteins. Liposomes are vehicles that delivers drugs or DNA within the body. So we, the liposomes serve as your synthetic vesicles, as what we've shown here in this photo. Plasma membranes of your eukaryotic cells have glycarbohydrates, glycolipids, and glycoproteins. And these chains of long sugars, we call it oligosaccharides, may be attached to several different amino acids. And there are two types of linkage. Your end linkages, which is shown in this image, and O linkages. Uh, these projections of sugars are playing an important role in mediating the interactions of the cell with its environment. So there is the end glycosidic linkage between asparagine and end acetylglucosamine, which is more common than the old glycosidic linkage between serine or threonine and the end acetylglucosamine. Glyco lipid carbohydrates of the RBC plasma membrane determines whether a person's blood type is A. B, A, B, or O. In uh, type A, the enzyme adds n acetylgalactosamine to the end of the chain. In B, the enzyme adds galactose to the chain terminus. And when both enzymes are present, it's the A, B. Uh, o lack the enzymes capable of attaching either the terminal sugar. So there are blood group antigens. Whether the person has a type A, B, A, B, or O, Blood is determined by this short chain of sugars which are attached to the membrane lipids and proteins of the RBC membrane. So the oligosaccharides attached to the membrane lipids forming more ganglioside producing the A, B, and O blood types which are shown again in this figure. So we have here uh, uh, these oligosaccharides once again are forming the membrane lipids forming a gangliocyte producing A, B, and O. A person with type AB blood has gangliocytes with both the A and B structure. Remember, uh, these are your amino acids ga uh, and um, some sugars, gal, galactose, GLC-NAC, and acetylglucosamine, glucose, we have fucose, and gal-NAC, and acetylglucosamine. These are the blood group antigens. Integral membrane proteins. These function as receptor to bind ligands, or sometimes channels, or be used as transporters to move ions and solutes across the membranes. They are once again amphiphatic, and um, they have these hydrophilic and hydrophobic portions. And this is preserving the membrane uh, permeability barrier. Okay, they are being driven by van der Waals forces between amino acids and lipids, and proteins can be surrounded by a closely applied shell of lipid molecules. 
A good example of that is your aquaporin. Aquaporin is a membrane protein containing four subunits. They are colored differently in this illustration. You will see here the green, blue, the tangerine, and uh, peach. So analysis of this protein structure revealed that the presence of a surrounding layer of bound lipid molecules. In this case, these lipid molecule molecules are not likely to play a role in the function of the aquaporin because I think the protein retains its function as a water channel in bilayers containing non-native lipids. Okay, so they have a different purpose. Uh, that, uh, that's why they, 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 these are um, not likely to play a role in the in the function of these aquaporins. Okay, they are water channels once again. We have also peripheral protein membranes. Um, they are associated with the membrane by weak electrostatic bonds. There are other cytosolic peripheral proteins that are acting as like enzymes, specialized codes or factors, and they transmit transmembrane signals. Peripheral membrane proteins typically have a dynamic relationship with the membrane, and they are being recruited or released as needed. Now we will study the structure and properties of your integral proteins. It is very difficult to obtain crystals of integral membrane proteins for X-ray crystallography. Most solid structures are prokaryotic versions, which are smaller than their eukaryotic counterparts. Homology is used to learn about the structure and activity of the membranes of a protein family. You will see this figure as an integral protein which is residing within, embedded within the plasma membrane. So integral proteins, and their, they, they also have their tertiary structure of the photosynthetic reaction center of a bacterium. And we use the process or the technique we call X-ray crystallography to view this structure. You will see that this uh, protein contains three different membrane spanning polypeptides. They are shown in yellow, you see here, light blue, and dark blue. And they have this helical structure, okay? Um, this helical structure is evident in this figure of these transmembrane segments. Membrane lipids and membrane fluidity. The physical membrane state of uh, the membrane lipid is described by its fluidity or viscosity. If the temperature of the bilayer is kept relatively warm, which is the body temperature, 27 degrees Celsius, the lipid exists in a relatively fluid state. Molecules here in this figure retain a specified orientation. It depends on temperature. So there are two phospholipids shown in this photo. The phosphatidyl, phosphatidylcholine and the phosphatidyl ethanolamine. So the above the transition temperature, um, the lipid molecules and their hydrophobic tails are free to move in any directions as shown in the letter A. And even though they retain a considerable degree of order, they should stick, okay, uh, remain alongside with each other. Uh, photo on your right is the transition temperature where the movement of the molecules is greatly restricted okay the entire bilayer can be described as a crystalline gel so this is above and below transition temperatures when we maintain membrane fluidity one of the uh, one of again the factors is the internal temperatures that's why the most organisms can fluctuate with the temperature so cells respond by altering phospholipid composition in, in, in animals or in humans for instance 37 degrees celsius or the, the, this is the normal body temperature and um, the saturation is catalyzed by your enzymes desaturases your cells changes the types of phospholipids being synthesized in favor of those ones containing more unsaturated fatty acids. So if you want to check the previous lesson about the chemistry of life, you know that there are different types of amino acids and 
take a look why there are more unsaturated ad fatty acids being favored in your cell than the saturated ones. Now we have lipid rafts. You will see this photo, an image of the upper surface of an artificial lipid bilayer containing phosphatidyl, phosphatidyl choline. They are appearing as a black background and the sphingomyelin molecules in red. They organize themselves spontaneously into this orange colored rafts. The yellow peaks you'll see here showed the positions of a GPI anchored protein which is almost exclusively raft associated. So they are associated with lipid rafts. This is using an atomic force microscopes. They are measuring the height of various parts of uh, the specimen at the molecular level. And on your right is the schematic model of a lipid raft within the cell. So the outer lipid, the outer leaflet, okay, the leaflets of your raft consist primarily of your cholesterol and in yellow sphingolipids in red head groups. We have phosphatidylcholine, which are blue head groups with long saturated fatty acids also tend to concentrate in this region. There are also GPI anchored proteins which are thought to become concentrated in lipid rafts. The lipids in the outer leaflet of the raft have an organizing effect on the lipids of the inner leaflet. And as a result, this inner leaflet raft lipids consisting primarily of cholesterol and glycerophospholipids with long saturated fatty acyl tails. Your inner leaflet tends to concentrate a lipid anchored proteins such as your SRC kinase that are involved in cell signaling. Also with nat the dynamic nature of your cell membrane, they can move laterally, okay, um, a phospholipid can diffuse from one end of the bacterium to the other end of a, in a second or, or two. Flypases are what we call as the enzymes that move the certain phospholipids from one leaflet to the other. It could be a lateral shift, okay, lateral shift could be a flexing individual or it could be a transverse diffusion we call it the flip-flop these are the possible movements of phospholipids in your cell membrane the diffusion of membrane proteins after cell fusion there is a technique we call cell fusion where two different types of cells or cells from two different species can be fused to produce one cell. In your letter A, this is the outline of the experiment in which human and now cells were fused. There is two steps, the one and two, and the distribution of proteins on the surface of each cell that were followed in the hybrids over time, which is three and four. They are lab labeled three and four. The mouse membrane proteins are indicated by solid circles. Solid, it means uh, this solid here and um, human membrane proteins are the ones which has open circles those that don't have a shape locations of human and mouse proteins in your plasma membrane of the hybrid cells were being monitored by interaction with your fluorescent and fluorescent red and fluorescent green antibodies respectively and this photo on top of on, on my top is the micrograph showing you a fused cell in which the mouse and human proteins are still in their respective hemispheres. You will see here the cell fusion revealing mobility of your membrane proteins of human and mouse cells. After cell fusion, proteins can be labeled and being tracked. We labeled proteins with your fluorescent dye, your photo bleached spot with laser beams. We do recover, let the cell recover. Okay, proteins can be immobile, moving, mobile, not moving in a directed manner or exhibit random movement. So we will measure 
afterward to cell fusion the diffusion rates of each of the cell mem of membrane proteins by FRAP, fluorescence, recovery, after photo bleaching, FRAP. In this technique, a particular component of the membrane is first labeled, like say, fluorescent dye, and then a small region of the surface is then irradiated to the bleach dye, which are the bleach dye molecules in step two. The recovery of the fluorescence in the bleach region is followed over time, step three, and the fluorescence, uh, the, the rate of the fluorescence, which is in the Ill illuminated spot can be varying on the proteins being followed. So the rate of recovery, you'll see it in the last figure, is related to diffusion coefficient of the fluorescently labeled proteins. How do we control this membrane mobility? Protein movements are slower than predicted by protein size, of course how big the proteins are, and also with the membrane viscosity. Protein movements are like, limited by various interactions. There are some proteins that have barriers so lateral diffusion, so they're moving lateral, la in the lateral way. Depending on the cell type, again, and the conditions, integral membrane proteins can exhibit several different types of mobility. Protein A, you'll see here in this photo, is capable of diffusing randomly. Okay, it's random elsewhere throughout the membrane. Though its rate of movement may be limited, they can move elsewhere. Protein B is immobilized as the result of its interaction with the underlying membrane skeleton or the cytoskeleton. So they are attached to a cytoskeleton. Next is protein C. They are being moved in a particular direction as the result of its interaction with the mother protein at the cytoplasmic surface of the membrane. So in the, uh, in the inner leaflet of the membrane, there is a, there is a mother protein that means the protein C can move alongside with this motor protein. Uh, protein D and its movement also is restricted by other integral proteins. So they are stuck, okay, in the, uh, by, they are stuck within integral protein membranes. And protein E is restricted by fences, okay, formed by proteins of the membrane skeleton. Though there are transient openings in the fence, Movement of protein F, lastly, is restrained by extracellular materials. Continuous, continually, membrane lipid mobility, when we talk about the phospholipid diffusion, they are being restricted within the bilayer. The phospholipids are confined for a very brief period to certain areas. Fences, as what I mentioned earlier, restricting motion are constructed of rows of integral membrane proteins. You will see in this figure the experimental demonstration that diffusion of phospholipids within the plasma membrane is being confined. So there is a track of a single labeled unsaturated phospholipid, which is followed from 56 ms millisecond as it diffuses within the plasma membrane of a rat fibroblast. Remember what the fibroblasts are. Phospholipids diffuse freely um, within this confined compartment before hopping into a neighboring compartment. So there's a start and finish, okay? Um, the rate of diffusion in this, uh, within this compartment is as rapid as that expected by unhindered Brownian movement. However, the overall rate of this diffusion of this possible if it appears slowed because the molecule must hop a barrier to continue its movement. So there are barriers and there's a difficulty with this this phospholipid diffusion happening along the way. So this movement of the phospholipid again is um, represented by colors. Another letter B is this um, experiment that is um, being done, letter A. This is carried out for 33 milliseconds in an artificial bilayer, which lacks the picket fences or the picket fences present in the cell membrane. The much more open 
trajectory of the false polypid can now be explained by a simple, unconfined Brownian movement. Unlike the other one, the letter A is fenced, B is unfenced. For the sake of comparison, fake compartments were assigned in B and indicated by different colors. So there's a more a lot of colors com from compared to A, the experiment A. That's the that's the diffusion of phospholipids when the plasma membrane is being confined. With domain and polarity, most membranes vary in protein composition and mobility. Epithelial cells that line the intestines and kidneys have highly polarized cells. The apical membrane, plasma membrane, absorbs the substances from the lumen going inside the cell. So these are just the differentiated functions of the plasma membrane of an epithelial cell, for instance. This is an apical surface of um, intestinal epithelial cell that are containing some of these integral proteins that function in ion transport, remember, and hydrolysis of disaccharides such as sucrose, lactose, your lateral surfaces containing integral proteins that are functioning in intercellular interaction and all the basal surface contains integral proteins that function in the association of the cell with this underlying basement or basal membrane. Sperm, sperm cells may have the most highly differentiated structure. They are con uh, covered by a continuous plasma mem membrane and we're using antibodies that can detect and reflect the distribution of this protein. This example, this photo is um, the mammalian sperm. Okay, we show here their plasma membranes and revealed by fluorescent antibodies. And letters A to C, there are three pairs of micrographs, each showing the distribution of a particular protein at the cell surface, which are revealed by a bond fluorescent antibody. These three four proteins are being localized uh, in diff three different parts of this continuous cell membrane. Each pair of the photograph show the fluorescence pattern of the antibody bound and the phase contrast micrograph on the others on the, alongside with the photo of the same cell. Letter D is your diagram summarizing, you know, the diff distribution of the proteins. We have the anterior heads, posterior head, and the posterior tails. The red blood cell, the erythrocyte is an example of the plasma membrane structure. Human erythrocytes plasma membrane is the most studied and the most understood model for plasma membrane. They can be purified. You can get the purifi purified this membrane proteins. Uh, this is showing you a scanning electron micrograph of human erythrocyte on your left and on your right is your membrane ghosts. This is showing you membrane ghosts uh, on your right. They were isolated by allowing erythrocytes to swell and hemolyze as described in this photo. Erythrocyte membrane has its skeleton, the most common component in this internal membrane skeleton is your spectrin. Spectrin molecules are attached to the membrane surface to anchorin, and spectrin is linked to other cytoplasmic proteins as well. So we, s we see here the plasma membrane of the human erythrocyte. We're using scanning electron micrograph of your human erythrocytes. In letter B, you'll see here um, a micrograph showing the plasma membrane ghosts, which were isolated by allowing erythrocytes to swell and hemolyzed. Okay, this is coming from um, this. You'll see the bands in the this peripheral and integral portion. These are coming from the SDS poly acrylamide gel electrophoresis. We call it SDS phage. SDS phage is a method used to fractionate the proteins of the erythrocyte membrane. Of course, the proteins are being uh, they are classified according to their sizes. The larger the size um, going to the 
the lightest, the light, the, the, the most light protein size. Okay, their atomic mass. So th this is um, coming from the side of the gel. This photo here. These are the we see here the spectrin, the anchirin, the band four point one, actin G three PD, band three glycoforin A, and band seven. On your right is a model of the erythrocyte plasma membrane as viewed from the internal surface. So it shows you some of the integral proteins that are embedded in the peripheral, um, sorry, embedded in the lipid bilayer. And these are arranged um, using the peripheral proteins that are making up this membrane's internal skeleton. Substances can move across cell membranes, and we call it the selective permeability. It allows for the separation and exchange of materials across the cell membrane. Net flux is the difference between influx and efflux of materials. Substances move across the membranes by, we call it diffusion and active transport. There are four basic mechanisms by which the solute molecules move across the membrane. We're showing here the relative sizes of the letters indicate the directions of their concentration gradients. There is passive, where it doesn't need ATP. Active, it needs energy to uh, proceed and to uh, move on with the, with, the, with the movement. Another A is simple diffusion through the bilayer, which always proceeds from an area of higher to lower concentration. Letter B is non-mediated. It's a simple diffusion through an aqueous channel, such as your um, aquaporin, okay, that are formed within an integral membrane protein or a cluster of such protein. As in A, the movement is always down a concentration gradient from high to low. Letter C is facilitated diffusion. Um, the solute molecules bind specifically to a membrane protein carrier, which is what we call as your facilitative transporter. As in A and B, movement is always from high to low concentration. Letter D, active transport by means of protein transporters with a specific binding site that undergoes a change in affinity driven with energy. So it's called active. They are released by an exergonic process such as your ATP hydrolysis. Movement occurs against a concentration gradient. And in letter E, this is using oxygen, sodium, glucose, solju uh, sodium, and potassium, where each examples of each type of mechanism as it occurs in the membrane of your red blood cell. Water is diffusing, uh, diffuse, uh, diffusing through the membranes, and the diffusion of water through a semi-permeable membrane is called osmosis. In letter A, you will see here a cell is being placed in a hypotonic solution, one having a what? A lower solute concentration than the cell. Okay, it, as a result, it swells. The cell will swell because of a net gain of water by osmosis, that is E, a cell in a hypertonic solution shrinks because of a net loss of water by osmosis. That is C, is it is in an isotonic solution maintaining a constant volume because of the inward flux of water is equal to what is going out, okay? Inward flux is equal to outward flux. In, in, in the case of plants, they use osmosis in, in different ways as they are usually hypertonic compared to their fluid, in, fluid environment. So there is a tendency for water to enter the cell. Uh, we'll describe here the effects of osmosis on a plant cell. Aquatic plants, for example, are living underwater, um, living in fresh water, and they're surrounded with a hypotonic environment. So water therefore tends to flow into the cells and it creates trigger pressure. So that's why you will see that plants have typically large vacuoles which is 
um, storage for water. In letter B, if the plant cell is placed in a hypertonic solution, such as the seawater, the cell loses water and the plasma membrane pulls away from the cell wall. So again, in hypertonic solutions such as in the sea water, in salt water, the plant cell undergoes plasmolysis. Now we talk about diffusion of ions in uh, through the membranes. Most ion channels can exist in either an open or closed plant formation. That's why we call them gated. As you remember, gates have um, the opening and closing uh, fences. The three major categories of the gated channels are voltage gated channels, which are conformational state depending on the ionic charge difference on the two sides of the membrane. So you will measure extracellular and intracellular, cytosolic and the extracellular matrix part okay, outside the cell. You also have ligand gated channels depending on the binding of a specific molecule or a ligand. Mechano-gated channels, there are conformational states which are depending on mechanical forces that are being applied to the membrane. So let's talk about the conformation uh, of a voltage-gated potassium ion channels. So once these are open, more than 10 million potassium ions can pass through per second. After the channel is open for a few milliseconds, the movement of potassium ions is automatically stopped. So in this case, it, you will see a 3D model of a eukaryotic potassium ion channels. So when we inactivate this channel activity, one of the inactivation peptides dangles from the cytoplasmic region of the complex, fits in into the cytoplasmic opening of the channel. So they're going from the cytoplasmic portion of each complex going to the cytoplasmic opening of the channel. So you will see it in this um, figure, they will exist in three different states. First is open, inactivated, or at rest or closed. In experimental pathways, you'll see this whole micro electron micrograph of a negatively stained receptor-rich membrane from the electric organ of an electric fish showing the dense array of N NaCHR molecules. Each receptor molecule is seen as a small whitish circle with a tiny block dot in its center. The dot corresponds to a central channel which has collected an electron dense stain. Researchers have focused on this structure. Site directed mutagenesis has helped determine the residues that spawn the membrane. Electron micrographs showed the receptors as ring shape. And view, viewing it in, in molecularly, uh, you will see that They've used electron crystallography, again, to analyze the structure of the NACHR. The ion channel consists of a four lined by a five inner M2 alpha helices, one from each surrounding subunit. And the gate opening following the binding of two ACH molecules, one per subunit. So you'll see here an electron density map of a slice through NACHR obtained by analyzing electron micrographs of tubular crystals of torpedo membranes which are embedded in ice. There's a schematic diagram here in letter B of the arrangement of the subunits and their cross-identical or cross-sectional representation of the protein. Each of it has four membrane spanning helices, M1 to M4. Facilitate the diffusion. In many cases, the diffusing membrane binds selectively to a membrane spanning protein and we call it facilitative transporter. These FTs can mediate the movement of solutes in both directions. So, uh, this is a schematic model for the facilitated diffusion of glucose 
that's uh, depicting okay the alternating conformation of a carrier that exposes the glucose binding site to either the inside or outside of the membrane. So there is dissociation, transport, recovery. So it binds to the to this transporter, the FT, transports inside, it dissociates it, and then now it recovers and it's open again for a glucose to bind. A good example of it is insulin, which plays a key role in maintaining blood glucose levels. So an increase in glucose levels in your blood triggers insulin secretion by your pancreas, which stimulates the uptake of glucose. Rising insulin levels stimulates the movement of transporters to the surface of your cell. So this is what we call as the kinematics of the facilitated diffusion compared to simple diffusion, where simple diffusion doesn't need um, facilitated transporters. Active transport, where cells maintain an imbalance of ions across the cell membrane, which cannot happen by either simple or facilitated diffusion. If we need energy, they are generated by active transport. Coupled energy input is needed like ATP hydrolysis, light absorption, electron transport, or the flow of other substances down their gradients. So these are examples of ions. You'll see sodium, potassium, chlorine, calcium, and hydrogen. Their extracellular concentration outside the cell, their intracellular concentration, and their ionic gradient. In a typical mammalian cell, you will see these ions. Primary active transport, coupling transport to ATP hydrolysis. So this is your uh, sodium and potassium ATPase enzyme uh, model, it's a schematic model of the transport cycle. So we have your sodium ions, they bind to the protein on the inside of the membrane. ATP is being hydrolyzed and the phosphate is being transferred to the protein. And number two, it changed its conformation. Number three, it allows sodium ions to be expelled to the outer, to the external space. Potassium ions then bind to the protein. And the phosphate group is subsequently lost. And number five, it causes the protein to snap back on its original conformation, allowing more potassium ions to diffuse into the cell. The cation binding sites are located number six within the transmembrane domains. They are transcending domains of the, uh, these proteins. Okay, They're consisting of 10 membrane-spanning helices. Note that the actual um, so, uh, sodium potassium ATPase is composed of at least two different membrane spanning subunits. One larger alpha subunit which carries out the transport activity and a smaller beta subunit which functions primarily in the maturation and assembly of the pump within the membrane. There is also a third which is called the gamma subunit that may be also be present. So these are just the steps of uh, where the ATP binds to the protein prior to hydrolysis. This model here is the ETO conformation of the protein based on a recent x-ray crystallographic study. The two rubidium 
ions are located where the potassium ions would normally be found. This is what we call the E1 conformation. These are ion binding sites which are accessible to the inside of the cell. E2 conformation are ion binding sites accessible outside the cell. Okay? Potassium pump is found only in animal cells. That's why the ATP uh, so sodium potassium ATPase model is an E2 conformation. Binding sites are accessible to the outside of your cell. Well, there are other protein trans uh, primary ion transport systems. The best studied P type pump is the calcium ATPase, which are present in the ER to actively transport calcium out of the cytosol into the lumen of its organelle. There are also B-type pumps which are actively transporting hydrogen ions across the walls of your cytoplasmic organelles. There are a B-type pump in the plasma membrane of kidney tubules helps maintain the body's acid-base balance okay, by secreting protons into their forming urine. For the active transport, other primary ion transport systems that we can find in the human body is in the stomach. It contains the P-type pump and your hydrogen and the potassium ATPase, which secretes a solution of concentrated acid. Acid secretion can be controlled in the stomach. In the resting state, the hydrogen and potassium ATPase molecules are present in the walls of your cytoplasmic vehicles. Well, there, the, in cytoplasm, there are vehicles. These H and K ATPase molecules are found surrounding each of these vehicles. Not just one, but a lot of them. When the food enters the stomach, it triggers a cascade of hormone-stimulated reactions in the stomach wall that will lead to the release of histamines, which will bind to the receptor on the surface of your acid-secreting parietal cells. These are specialized cells that are found in the stomach which secretes acid, making your acid, making your stomach acidic. Binding of histamine to its receptor will stimulate a response that causes your hydrogen and potassium ATPase containing vehicles to fuse to the plasma membrane. So this is making um, transforming okay, all of these receptor of your histamine when binds to its receptor, these vesicles will fuse to the plasma membrane, forming a deep folds or what we call as your canaliculi. So you will see in this figure that there are foldings okay um, in your in your cells so once at the surface the transport protein is activated and pumps a lot of protons into the stomach cavity against a concentration gradient so you will see that the images um, hydrogen and potassium are indicated by the size of the letters so when there is um, small hydrogen here Outside, it will be um, a lot of hydrogen ions, small potassium ions on the outside, and then bigger amount of potassium in the inside, or in the cytosol of the cell. So there's a good example of uh, the pharmacokinetics of it, the heartburn drug, Prilosec. It blocks the acid secretion by directly inhibiting this hydrogen and potassium ATPase, whereas several other acid-blocking medications interfere with the activation of your parietal cells. Acid neutralizing agents, those with hydroxy, uh, hydroxyl group, provide basic anions that combine with the secreted protons. In human perspective, um, defects in ion channels and transporters as a cause of inherited disease. This is an explanation for this debilitating effects of lung functions from the presence of your CFTR proteins. Okay, so you will see this image, um, an airy epithelia of a normal individual where, where water flows out of the epithelial cells in response to the outward movement of ions. Thus, the mucus layer is being hydrated. Okay, the mucus layer has a surface, it's being hydrated. And um, when it's hydrated, the, the, the trapped bacteria is readily being moved out of the airways. 
in the area of, on the other hand, of a uh, person with cystic fibrosis, the abnormal movement of ions causes the water to flow in the opposite direction. Okay? Opposite direction. And you see here, um, the, the, the abnormal movement of ions causes the water to flow in the again opposite direction, thus dehydrating the mucus layer. A result of this, the trapped bacterium cannot be moved out of the airways, which allows them to proliferate as a biofilm, which are communities of microbes causing chronic infections. These are the inherited disorders, um, defects in ion channels and transporters, the types of channel, it could be calcium, potassium, sodium, chlorine, or the three, the genes associated to it, and the clinical consequences. Migrant headaches, ataxia, periodic myotonia, epileptic convulsions, deafness, dizziness, periodic myotonia, paralysis, hypertension, muscle weakness, kidney stones, periodic myotonia, kidney dysfunction, lung congestion, irregular or rapid heartbeat in the case of cardiac arrhythmias. Co-transport. So this is a coupling transport to existing ion gradients. There is potential energy stored in ionic gradients which is utilized to perform work. Sodium concentration is kept low by a sodium potassium ATPase pump. And diffusion of sodium ions down a concentration gradient drives the co-transport of glucose. So there is a co-transport happening here. Where in the secondary transport, we're using energy stored in what? Ionic gradients. So example of it is here, sodium potassium ATPase living in the plasma membrane of the lateral surface, maintaining a very low cytosolic concentration of sodium. The sodium gradient across the plasma membrane represents a storage of energy that can be tapped to accomplish work, such as the transport of glucose by a sodium glucose co-transporter, okay, located in the apical plasma membrane. It's in the apex, okay? So you see it in blue, this red, sodium uh, potassium and then once transported across the apical surface into the cell the glucose molecules diffuse to the basal surface the blue one found in the base where they are carried by a glucose facilitated transporter out of the cell and into the bloodstream so going to the bloodstream the relative size of the letters so, so the bigger it is the smaller it is are the directions of their respective concentration gradients. You see they're from low to high, like high to low. Okay? Two sodium ions are transported for each glucose molecule. There is a ratio, two is to one, of a sodium glucose providing a much greater driving force for a moving glucose into the cell than a one is to one ratio. This figure is a schematic model of the transport cycle of your secondary transporter. There are four different conformation states during this transport cycle of your bacterial symporter of the leucine T family are shown in this figure. The protein actively transports the amino acid leucine into the cell using an established sodium ion region as its source of energy. In step one, you'll see that the outer gate in the protein channel is, pro is open, which allows both sodium and leucine to reach their binding sites from the extracellular space. In step two, the outer uh, gate will close, occluding the substrates within the protein. In step three, a second leucine molecule binds to another site just outside the outer gate. In step 4, the inner gate opens and the substrates are released into the cytoplasm. The proteins returns to its original state when the what? The inner gate is now closed and the outer gate is open. 
So this sodium gradient helps transport selusine, an amino acid, into bacteria. If we move forward with the membrane potentials and the nerve impulses. So this is an example of a structure of a nerve cell. A schematic drawing of a simple neuron with a myelinated action. As the inset shows, the myelin sheath comprises of individual squan cells. They have wrapped themselves around the axon. These sites where the axon lacks myelin, um, this myelin wrapping, are called the nodes of Ranvier. Take note that the myelin forming cells within the central nervous system are called oligodendrocytes, oligodendrocytes, rather than squan cells. Below is a composite micrograph of a single sample neuron with cell body and dendrites, which are shown in purple, okay, and an axon uh, in one centimeter in length, shown in red. Motor nerve cells in larger mammals can be 100 times in its length. So, nerve cells, composite, micrograph of one rat hippocampal neuron. Now, this is a review of your physiolo physiology, the resting potential. The resting potential is the membrane's potential of a nerve cell or a muscle cell subject to changes when it's being activated. Potassium gradients are maintained by the potassium ATP responsible for the resting potential. In this figure, you will see the uh, measuring, how do we measure the membrane's resting potential. The potential is measured when a difference is uh, in charge is detected between the reference and recording electrodes. In letter A, both electrodes are on the outside of the cell. See here, and there is no potential difference or voltage being measured as one electrode penetrates the plasma membrane of the axon in letter B. In letter B, there is a potential immediately dropping to the negative 70 millivolts because it's electric, uh, it is negatively inside, uh, negative inside, approaching this equilibrium potential. That's why it's, it stagnates, okay? It reaches this threshold for potassium ions. That is the potential that would result if the membrane were impermeable to all ions except potassium. Action potentials. Review. When cells are simulated, sodium channels will open and causing the membrane to depolarize. When cells are simulated, voltage-gated sodium channels triggering the action potential. Excitable membranes exhibit all or none behavior. So how do we form an action potential? In letter A, you will see the time, time one. In the upper left box, you will see that the membrane in this region of the nerve cell exhibits the resting potential in which only the potassium leak channels are open and the membrane voltage is approximately negative 70 millivolts. In time 2, in the upper middle box, you'll so show it here, it shows the depolarization phase. The membrane has depolarized beyond its threshold value and it opens the voltage regulated sodium gates that's leading to an influx of sodium ions as indicated in the permeability change in the lower graph. So when there is an increase of sodium permeability, it will cause the membrane voltage to temporarily reverse itself, reaching a value of approximately positive 40 millivolts in the, we're using a squid giant axon this time, okay, in time two. It is the reversal of the membrane potential that constitutes the action potential. In time 3, the last box, the upper right box, it shows the rate polarization 
phase. Within a tiny fraction of a second, the sodium gates are inactivated and the potassium gates open. It allows your potassium ions to diffuse across the membrane and establish an even more negative potential. It's not negative 70, but it's negative 80 millivolts that, uh, that they are in resting potential. Okay? Almost as soon as they open, the potassium gates close. The potassium gates will close, leaving the potassium leak up channels as the primary path of ion movement across the membrane and re-establishing the membrane potential. Showing you the letter B, the summary of the voltage changes that happen during an action potential as being described later in, uh, earlier in part A. This figure is the propagation of an impulse resulting from the local flow of ions unidirectionally. An action membrane or an action potential at one side of the membrane depolarizes an adjacent region of the membrane. Then it triggers an action potential at the second side. The action potential can only flow in the forward direction, so the direction is moving on the opposite side. Yeah, forward direction because the portion of the membrane that has just experienced an action potential remains in a refractory period. So there's a refractory period, an action potential, and a region where depolarization will trigger an action potential. In propagation of action potentials and impulse, speed is of essence. The speed of neural impulse depends on the axon diameter and whether the axon is myelinated. Nearly all of the sodium ion channels of how my myelinated neuron reside in the unwrapped gaps, or what we call as your nodes of Ranvier. The nodes of Ranvier are the only sites where action potentials can be generated, jumping from one node to node. So you'll, so, uh, you'll see here in this figure is saltatory conduction. During saltatory conduction, only the membrane in the nodal region of the axon becomes depolarized and capable of forming an action potential. This is accomplished as current flows directly from an activated node to the next resting node along the axon. Near transmission, jumping the synaptic cleft. So there are what we call as presynaptic neurons. They communicate with both synaptic neurons at a specialized junction. We call them synapse. Okay? They are across synaptic clefts. And do we transmit these chemicals called neurotransmitters, which are released from the pre, pre cleft, diffusing to the receptors of the post synaptic cell. Showing you the, the photo of a neuromuscular junction where the side of branches from a motor axon form a synapses with the muscle fibers of your skeletal muscle. The left inset shows the synaptic vesicles residing with the terminal lobe of the axon and the narrow synaptic cleft between the terminal lobe and the post-synaptic part itself. The right inset will show you, this inset, this small figure here, show you a terminal lobe pressed closely against the muscle cell plasma membrane. The neurotransmitter molecules in red from the synaptic vesicles of the presynaptic neuron are binding to the receptors in orange on the surface of your muscle cell, which is in blue. The polarization of the presynaptic cell causes your calcium channels in the membrane to open. The calcium stimulates the fusion of membranes within the membrane. And the neurotransmitter binding to ion channel receptors can either stimulate or inhibit action potential. These are the sequence of events during the synaptic transmission with acetylcholine as the neurotransmitter. During the steps 1 to 4, a nerve impulse reaches the terminal knob of the axon. The calcium gates open, leading to the influx of calcium ions and acetylcholine is released from synaptic vesicles that binds to the where the receptor on the post synaptic membranes if 
the binding of these neurotransmitter molecules causes a depolarization of the postsynaptic membrane, a nerve impulse may be generated. Okay? In six, you'll see a nerve impulse. If, however, the binding of a neurotransmitter causes a hyperpolarization of the postsynaptic membrane, in 5B, see here 5B, the target cell is inhibited, making it more difficult for an impulse to be generated in the target cell, okay? By by other excitatory stimulation. This breakdown of the neurotransmitter by acetyl cholinesterase is not shown in this figure. These are the sequence of events. Acetylcholine inhibits heart contractility but stimulates contractility of skeletal muscle. Glutamate serves as the primary excitatory neurotransmitter in gamma aminobutyric acid as the primary inhibitory neurotransmitter. Now we go with green cells. Electrical signaling in plants, they are containing voltage gated potassium channels. There are action potentials in plant cells as we um, expect animals, but plants, they also have the Venus flytrap, for instance, catches insects in a trap. When an insect touches the mechanosensitive hairs inside the trap, an action potential is created by chloride and potassium channels spreading through the tissue and causes the trap to close. Now with engineering linkage near technology, Neurons use electrical signaling, so there is a promise to control them by using some electrical devices implanted to the patient. And the most successful to date is the cochlear implant. Showing you here in this big photo is a flexible silicone elastomer containing last platinum electrodes. Wires inside the rod lead to different electrodes, allowing them to be controlled individually. So once again, I thank everyone for watching The Cell Membrane and don't forget to like and subscribe to my channel. Have a nice day everyone. Bye-bye.